Okay, so we should be here now. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Brayden Walker, and I am uh, coming here on behalf of MS Cubed, uh, Mathematics and Statistics Student Society here at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, we are here with our second talk of the year. Uh, we have our esteemed uh, VP internal here, uh, Robert Lika, to talk to us uh, in his talk for asympt or not asymptotics. Um, sorry, uh, <laughs> polygons and magnetic, magnetic models here. Uh, or wait, are we? I don't know. Oh, maybe I'm behind on the thing. Never mind. Never mind. I was just uh, being stupid. Okay, so uh, Robert Leake is a Bachelor of Science uh, Honors student in Mathematical Physics. He wrote his honors thesis last year, Asymptotics of the Moduli Space of Higgs Bundles. And uh, a little fact about Robert is he's the first two-time 50-minute speaker for MS Cubed. Not the first two-time speaker. Uh, that's someone else, but Robert's uh, going to have the record for most uh, time speaking for MS Cubed uh, right now. So that's awesome. And uh, I'm going to let him take it away with his talk. So you can go ahead and share your screen and All right. I make the necessary okay, cool. adjustments. All right. Let's do this. Um, hopefully people can see clearly, uh, but my talk is polygons and magnetic monopoles. And so we will begin this talk by considering a triangle. We have our nice gray shaded triangle here. Um, and the question is, what is the boundary? Well, we can draw the boundary simply as just the dotted line that outlines the triangle. Great, which is perfect. But now to go deep into the math of this. And I don't know if you recall, but I gave a talk about this exact topic last year. Um, but, of course, I'm going to briefly discuss some of the results and, and things that I discussed at, at that talk. So, first off, an R simplex. What is an R simplex? Well, a simplex is an R-dimensional object labeled by R plus 1 points. So, we have R plus 1 points P0, P1 through PR, which is usually it's a points in Rn, uh, where R is less than or equal to N. And we usually denote the simplex by simply brackets, and then the list of points, or the R plus one points are geometrically independent. And what that means is that not all of the R plus one points lie in the same uh, R minus one dimensional subspace. So for example, here's a picture of, of some simplices. A zero simplex is just defined to be a point. Uh, one simplex is defined as a line where you have two points. Uh, two simplex is three points, which is defined as a triangle. And then, of course, a three simplex, you have four points, which is your tetrahedron. And these are all points are geometrically independent because not all points lie in the same uh, R minus one dimensional subspace. So, for example, on this triangle, not all three points are in a line. Um, if you just had a line with three points on that line, then those points would be geometrically dependent. And uh, that's not, not what we need. Um, and so, Another definition is that a set of simplices in Rn, where each simplex has dimension less than or equal to n, is called the simplicial complex, denoted k. So k is really just a set of all these different simplices. Uh, so we just take a bunch of simplices, put them in a set, and this is our simplicial complex, which we call k. And I didn't write it down, but the dimension of k is equal to the dimension of the uh, highest dimension of simplex you have in your set. Um, so if K is a simplicial complex, then the set of all oriented sim R simplices, which I denote by C sub R K, forms a group. Uh, it actually forms a free abelian group that is generated by these oriented R simplices. So what does oriented mean? Here's a, a, a key word used, oriented. I didn't talk about oriented, but essentially what an oriented simplex is, is if, say, for example, if I take this triangle, if I say if this is P0, this is P1, and this is P2, then if I label it as P0, P1, P2, I could go in the reverse direction, P2, P1, P0, but at the exchange of a minus sign. So there's a specific orientation that happens. And so these are all examples of oriented simplices, and these are the ones that we want in our uh, group, which I call the R chain group. So the R chain group is the set of all oriented simplices in your simplicial complex. 
Great. Perfect. Now, a general element in this R chain group can be written as a sum, which, I mean, is really just a linear combination of the different generators that you have, the different, uh, of the different, uh, sorry, of the different, um, or, uh, oriented simplices in your simplicial complex. And of course, you're summing up to the number of oriented simplices that you have. Now, the, the key point here is that we can define a mapping called a boundary map, which is given by this rule, but it associates to a simplex its boundary. It gives you the boundary of it. So for example, if we gave it a triangle, this operator will give us the boundary of the triangle. Going back up here, this boundary map takes in a simplex. This is, of course, our uh, three simplex, and it'll return us the boundary, which is which is important. So, as a, an important theorem, actually, about the boundary map is that it satisfies this equation, um, which is essentially saying if you take a simplex, compute its boundary, and then you compute the boundary of the boundary, you get zero, which is interesting. And of course, the proof. Well, you guys know what to do. Let's come on. It's an exercise. W what do you want from me? Of course, always. It's always an exercise. Come on. So, as an example, let's take our triangle. Uh, and to kind of compute this is first, it's a summation where you start from i equals zero. And I didn't really mention it, but this notation, this hat pi, means you exclude that point. So if we look at our triangle p naught, p one, p two, we start with p naught. So you get rid of p naught, and then you have p1, p2. And then you always alternate signs. So second, now you have a minus sign, but now we take away p1. So we have p naught, p2. And then alternating signs, we get plus, take away p2, p naught, p1. And this expression right here is really just the boundary of our triangle, where we have three lines that make up this triangle, where each line is really just a, a, a two simplex. So we can see that. We have this line right here is defined by P naught P1. This line right here is defined as P1 P2. This line right here is defined as P naught P2. And the boundary of this triangle is given by a, you can think of it as a sum of these three simplices. So these three simplices make up your boundary of a triangle. And notice that, um, the boundary map, it always takes an R simplex, right, and returns an R minus one simplex. That's that's also important. So in this case, the triangle was a three simplex. And the simplex we get by taking the boundary is a two simplex, which makes sense, of course, right? The boundary, you can think of it as being a closed loop or a line, really. And each line is is given by a two simplex. And the cool thing is that if we took the boundary again of this two simplex, we would get zero. So going back to our original question at the beginning, now what is the boundary of the boundary of a triangle? Well, intuitively, it makes sense. You just say it's zero. Well, because th there isn't really a boundary. What is the boundary of this object? Well, there isn't one, right? So it, it's it's nice that how we define this boundary operator, it's almost natural that the boundary of a boundary is zero. There is no boundary on a boundary. It's kind of kind of confusing, but it's it's nice to look at. There isn't really a boundary on this object. And this is what the boundary operator is telling us. So this is a very important operator. This operator is very nice. But using this operator, we can define groups, which is nice. So if Z sub R is an R simplex in our R chain group, such that the boundary applied the boundary operator applied to the simplex is zero in other words if this r simplex is in our kernel of our boundary map then we'll call z sub r an r cycle so essentially an r cycle is a simplex that lives in the kernel of this boundary operator perfect now another definition is if we have an r simplex and there exists an R plus one simplex. So this is a higher dimensional simplex, where if I take the boundary of this R plus one dimensional simplex, I get back my V sub R, 
then B sub R is not a boundary. In a sense, B sub R is the boundary of some higher dimensional simplex. And we define that to be an R boundary, which is nice. Now, an exercise from Mahmood, uh, prove that all R cycles form a group under addition and call this group Z sub R. And similarly, show that the set of all R, R boundaries forms a group under addition and call this group B sub R. But notice that B sub R is actually a subset of Z sub R. What that, what, I, what that means is that every R boundary is an R cycle. To see this, uh, suppose we have some R boundary. That means there exists a higher dimensional object, uh, R plus one dimensional uh, simplex, where when we take the boundary, we get B sub R. So B sub R is the boundary of some other simplex. Well, I can take the boundary Robert. of B sub R. We have a question yeah. from Mahmoud oh. in the chat. Uh, Mahmoud says, is every R cycle also in the image of the boundary operator? On it, but answer my question first. Is every R cycle also in the image of the boundary operator? Oh, good question. So um, if every R boundary is in the image um, of your boundary operator, but the strict question was, is every R cycle in the image of some boundary operator? I not in general, no. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't think so. But if we are looking at R boundaries, uh, then R boundaries are, of course, by definition, in the image of uh, the boundary operator for your higher dimensional simplex. I don't know if that answers your question, but in general, I don't know, to be honest with you, but I do know, of course, that every R boundary is in the image of a boundary operator by definition, essentially. Um, and so going back to seeing how every R uh, boundary is in R cycle is if we take the boundary of this object, well, we know that B sub R is the boundary of another object. And going back to that theorem where the boundary of a boundary is zero, this shows that B sub R is, of course, an R cycle, which is nice. Now, because of this, we can form another group called the R homology group, which looks confusing. If you've never seen this notation before, it might look confusing, uh, but that's okay. What this is saying really is we take the group of all R cycles and this operation, this kind of division side, is, is called a quotient. We're quotienting by uh, R boundaries. And what that really means is that this R homology group is really just the set of all R cycles plus uh, the set of all R boundaries, where, of course, Z plus B sub R K is really just, of course, equal to the set of that specific Z sub R plus every single um, R boundary in B sub R. So in a sense, and Mahmood, me and Mahmood had a really deep philosophical debate about this, but really this quotient group is, is a set of sets. That, that's all it is. It's, it's, it's a set, which each element in that set is another set. And you can see that from this. And so that was kind of a quick recap of homology groups. Um, in itself is a very fascinating subject. This is more specifically simplicial homology because you can have general uh, homological groups and stuff that have nothing to do with uh, these polygons. But this is will relate very closely to our next topic, which is, of course, this is the this is like this is like the the New Testament. If okay, if the Old Testament in mathematics was Newton's calculus, then the New Testament is differential forms. This is really the, this is like, this is good stuff right here. Um, and this is the story. So what are differential forms? Well, we know that from first year calculus, if F is a smooth function, or if F is an integrable function from R to R on the interval, then we can integrate it from A to B. And this gives us the area under the curve. And 
what you might have been taught is that, well, this dx, in terms of a Riemann summation, is the infin infinitesimal increment in the x coordinate. So if we wrote this as a Riemann sum, as a limit of Riemann sums, then if we had a particular partition for x, then we would have xi plus 1 subtracted by xi. And in the limit that these part the, the number of points in your partition get, get bigger and bigger, the distances between each point get finer and finer. And we call this infinitesimal difference dx. Okay, that's fine. Sure, why not? But now, if you've ever taken Math 238, or if you haven't and are going to, you will learn this technique that if we have some equation dy dx is equal to g of x, in differential equation theory, you are told that, oh, well, just multiply through by dx, integrate both sides, you're good to go. But if you think of this, dy dx, it's not literally a fraction of elements, right? Like, you, like remember, by definition, dy dx, it's a limit of, of this y x plus h minus y of x over h. You can't multiply it through by dx. What does that mean? That, that's not defined, really. And yet people use it all the time for differential equations without even kind of batting an eye to it. So what is this dx, really? Is it an increment? Is it, is it something that I can multiply through to solve differential equations? Well, what is this thing? Well, let's define it now. Let's actually, once and for all, end the conversation of what it is. So let's just suppose that dx is an infinite strip of constant height 1 along the x-axis. So this is an image of dx. And I, this is foreshadowing what we're going to call this object. But let's imagine it's just an infinite strip of equal height 1 along the x-axis. Now, we call this object a one form. We call dx a one form. And we can multiply this by an integrable function from r to r on some interval. And what this does is you can imagine it shapes this object. So the height now, instead of being a constant height 1, becomes f of x, with the height at some point c on your interval, of course, just being given by f of c. And now we can integrate this thing using our methods that we were taught in first year. And this, we know, gives us the area under the curve. So in a sense, dx is like a, it's like a clay sort of strip that molds to whatever function you multiply it to, which is, which is nice. And similarly, on that note, we can do this for higher dimensions too. Imagine if we took two-dimensional. Uh, two-dimensional functions. We could think of an object called a two-form, where instead of just having our x-axis, we have an x-axis and a y-axis. Now, let's write this as dx wedge dy. We'll discuss this holy symbol later, but for now, imagine dx wedge dy as just combining two strips together, two infinite strips attached to each other. Now. I tried making this in LaTeX, uh, this picture, and I wasn't very successful, but it kind of gets the image across. You can sort of imagine it as two strips meeting each other perpendicularly, and it kind of gives you like a weird infinite-sized kind of box, or an infinite-sized rectangle with constant height 1, where we can call this thing dx, and we can call this thing dy which is nice. So now when multiplied by a function, now this is going to be an integrable function from R2 to R. Now, don't worry if you've never seen or if you've never learned how to integrate functions from R2 to R or from Rn to R, if you've never taken 277, that's okay. We do not need to know the techniques of integration. But if we were to integrate such a function on some rectangle AB cross CD, which this is just saying, if we take an interval a, b, and we combine it perpendicularly with another interval c, d to make a, a rectangle, uh, this, if we multiply it by our two form, it gives us a weird surface-like structure. 
and where for some I and A, B, and J and C, D, F of I, J gives the height above this sort of rectangle. So the same thing, if when we had a one form and we multiplied it by a function from R to R, this sort of shaped it into the graph of a function like this. And you can imagine if we multiplied this two form by a function from R2 to R, it'll sort of shape it into like a weird sort of surface like structure. And we can integrate this object, this, this function. And by doing so, this sort of gives us a certain volume under the surface you can think of, which is nice. So somehow integrating these, these, these differential forms gives us a sense of volume of, of, a, of a generalized volume, as you will, which is nice. Now, this wedge product, I said we would talk about it, is it, it, it satisfies a certain rule. It, it's, it's an anti-commutative product. And what that means is that if we take dx wedge dy, this is the same as minus dy wedge dx. And you can kind of see it pictorially as well. We could have, if we have dx as a strip here and dy as a strip here, you can imagine swapping dx and dy. So if instead this was dy and this was dx, you can think of it as almost looking from it underneath. And if we multiply by a function with dx and dy swapped, instead of the graph being upwards, it'll almost be downwards. So it'll give you sort of like a negative volume, which is, I guess, the, this is the reason why we would require this sort of rule. Now. We can think of R3, and which is three-dimensional space. We can have three different strips now in three dimensions. We could have dx, we could have dy, and we could have dz. And similarly, we could play this game again where we could have a three form, dx, wedge, dy, wedge, dz, which you can think of as just attaching or gluing another infinite strip, which will give you sort of an infinitely sized three-dimensional rectangle with constant volume one. And we can also have two forms in R3 though, right? We could have dx wedge dy, which again will give us an infinite size rectangle along the dx or along the x and y plane. We could have dx wedge dz or we could have dy wedge dz. Now let's define these to be basis elements for all two forms in R3. And the reason why we do this is because we could obtain any two form we want just from a combination of these three. But why not dy wedge dx or dz wedge dy? Why don't we have these as basis elements? Well, if we define these as basis elements, I can always obtain a combination of these three from just swapping dy and dx, right? Recall that, of course, dx wedge dy is minus dy wedge dx. So if I choose, if I take dy wedge dx, I could always obtain my original basis element just from swapping it, and then I get a minus sign. Of course, if you wish, you could define these to be basis elements. And similarly, you would have dz wedge dx, which is fine, but it all depends on what sort of orientation you would like. Um, if you define these to be basis elements, in certain computations, you would just have an extra minus sign, which is fine, but it's, uh, as a rule of thumb, these, we'll take these to be basis elements for two forms in R3. Now, how many three forms do we have on R3? Well, we only have the one, right? We only have dx, wedge dy, wedge dz. And, of course, we can always we can switch any of the two at a cost of a minus sign. This is the dark sacrifice of differential forms. You can always change to neighboring forms with each other at the cost of a minus sign. So if I have dx, wedge dy, wedge dz, I can swap the dx and dy to get minus dy, wedge dx, wedge dz. Similarly, I could swap the dy and dz to get minus dx, dz, dy, and so on. So for our three, there is only really one three form. Okay, so now let's count. How many 
two forms do we have in R3? Notice that on R3, we had dx wedge dy, dx wedge dz, dy wedge dz, which is given by three choose two. So in general, in Rn, the amount of k forms we have on Rn is going to be n choose k. And notice that this works out because if we compute this to say, how many three forms do we have in R3? Well, we would have three choose three, which is just one, which just gives us our original dx wedge dy wedge dz that we said we have. So this is a good method for computing the number of k forms on our end. In fact, we can collect a set of all k forms on our end, and we denote this by big wedge of k r n, and this actually forms a vector space. And the dimension of this vector space if, is n choose k. Now, we can write a general k form as this sum, where this looks confusing, and it looks complicated, but what it's saying is that if we have a k form, we can write it as a summation from these different indices, where each indice can be a value between 1 to n but we require there to be a strict uh, quality between the two. So I1 is supposed to be strictly less than I2, I2 is supposed to be strictly less than I3, and so on and so forth. And this gives us a general k-form, with the coefficient here being a function, usually from Rn to R. And so an example of this is we could write a two-form as some function f times dx1 wedge dx2. Now, of course, I'm switching gears here. Before, I was writing dx, dy, dz. But once you get up in higher dimensions, it it's almost easier to just work with x1, x2, x3, x4, because we have infinitely number of, of uh, natural numbers we can work with. We only have 26 letters in the alphabet. So I'm going to kind of switch a bit to talk about x1, x2, x3, where x1 is meant to be the x-axis, x2 is meant to be the y-axis, and x3 is meant to be the z-axis. So we can write a general two-form in R3 as such, where we have essentially a linear combination of the basis elements, which I was talking about earlier, dx1 wedge dx2 plus dx1 wedge dx3 plus dx2 wedge dx3. And a three-form may be written as such, where it's just a function times dx1, wedge dx2, wedge dx3, because there's only one free form in R3. Now, the meat, the meat of this is another map called the exterior derivative, which is going to be a mapping that takes in a k form and gives you a k plus one form. And it's defined by this equation here. Now, again, this looks confusing. Uh, there's too many indices going on. Like, this is, this is too insane. This is too much. Um, but there's another way to think about this, and you can think of d omega if omega is written as as it is up here. This is nothing but the Jacobian of if you've taken two seventy six. That is, this is just the usual Jacobian that you were taught in two seventy six, and you take this Jacobian and you multiply it by uh, a column vector, where the column vectors are dx one through dx n. And then you take this product, and then you wedge it with your resulting uh, basis that you have here. So for an example, for a two-form, if we write a two-form on R3, that is, now I'm going back to x, y, and z. If I write it as f dx wedge dy and g dy wedge dz, then computing the exterior derivative, Following this rule, really what you do is you differentiate the function with the one form that's not present. So if this is a two form, we know we need a three form, and the third coordinate we need is dz. Um, so I could do df dz, dz wedge dx wedge dy. Of course, I'm really supposed to be summing over each coordinate. So I'm supposed to be doing df by dx, and then dx wedge dx wedge dy, but because of the rule, which is up here, because of this right here, this implies that if I wedge a one form with itself, I get zero, right? So if I just replaced y with x here, and I get dy wedge or dx wedge dx is equal to minus dx wedge dx, I can move it on both sides, 
and then I'll give me that DX, which DX is zero. So that's why I kind of don't really bother differentiating with, with respect to X or Y in this case, because I'm going to get zero anyways. Um, similarly, I have DH by DX because DX is the one I have missing and I have DX wedge DY wedge DZ. And of course I can simplify it so it looks nice and it's in its basis element, which is a three form. So the exterior derivative took a two form, my psi, and gave me back a three form, which is great. Now, another theorem, which says that if you have any K form, uh, now I'm gonna write the exterior derivative with a little subscript K to, to make you think that or to make you remember that it's taking in a k form and returning a k plus one form. So that means d sub k plus one takes in a k plus one form, returns you a k plus two form. But it turns out that if you take the exterior derivative of a differential form that you already took the exterior derivative of, that is if you take it twice, you get zero. So this actually equals zero for any k form on our end, which is interesting. Uh, if this reminds you of the boundary of a boundary is zero, that's good. It seems like there's some connection between the two. And we will discover this connection. Now, a couple definitions. Very similar to the ones we made for our cycles and our boundaries. A K form, we're going to call it closed. If we take the exterior derivative of omega, we get zero. That is, if omega is in the kernel, of the exterior derivative, we call that closed. And we denote the set of all closed forms by z sub k of Rn, which is of course gonna be a subset. In fact, it's gonna be a subspace of wedge k. Similarly, if we take a k form, we're gonna call this k form exact if there exists a k minus one form psi, such that if I take the exterior derivative of psi, I get my eta back. So as if eta is in the image of d sub k minus 1, I'm going to call eta exact. Where d sub k minus 1 takes in a k minus 1 form and gives me a k form, which is going to be eta. And we call the set of all exact forms b sub k, which is, of course, going to be a subset of wedge k. But of course, these spaces actually form subspaces. They form vector subspaces of our vector space wedge k. Now, can you prove this? This is an exercise for you, Mahmoud. There you go. Now, we can define another group called the k cohomology group. And it's going to be defined in the exact same way we defined the, the k or the r homology group. It's going to be a quotient of these closed forms with a quotienting off by these exact forms. Now, of course, this is confusing notation, but really what it means is that the k cohomology group is going to be written as the set of sets again. It's going to be written as omega plus b is okay, where omega is a closed form, but really this is equal to the set of each set, where we have omega plus eta, where eta is a, an exact form. So again, this space is really just a set of sets, where each element is a set of omega plus eta for every exact form. Now, there is a reason for this for the notation for simplicial homology and cohomology groups. Remember, they're almost identical, right? The only difference in notation is that for homology groups, I have my subscript at the bottom. And I defined it like this. Whereas for my cohomology groups, I wrote it as my k up here. Now, it almost looks like they're identical, right? And there's a reason why the notation looks identical. Now, I'm going to define an inner product. The inner product isn't really an inner product because now, if you've taken 277, you of course know what an inner product is. If you haven't taken 277, an inner product is just a way of, it's a function on a space that takes in two vectors and gives you a number. So the dot product, if, you've, if you know about the dot product from 276, this is an example of an inner product where it takes in two vectors and gives you a number. Now this isn't really an inner product because 
most definitions of inner product require you to take the Cartesian product of the same space with itself. So it's not quite an inner product, but it, it kind of is. It's a non-degenerate bilinear form, if you know what that means. And I'm going to define it to be its inputs are going to be an R chain with an R form. So it takes in an R chain and it takes in an R form and it returns a number. And I'm going to define this mapping to be such. Now, I'm going to be integrating this R form over this R chain. But what does that really mean? What, what is an R chain? Recall that an R chain is, it's, it's, it's sort of, I, I might have forgotten to mention it, but it's, it's a generalized polygon in a sense. It's, it's a way of taking the different simplices, you know, your point, your line, triangle, your tetrahedron, and making a combination of the two. You can think of them as being building blocks for making higher dimensional polygons, and we're going to be integrating over them. So, of course, if you've taken 277, you might have done exercises where you had to integrate a certain differential form over a triangle, or you had to integrate a certain differential form over a tetrahedron. And this is exactly what we're doing. So this is integration from 277 that you learned. If you haven't taken 277, that's okay. We don't really need to go in the techniques of integration, but uh, for our purposes for the talk, let's just imagine that we're summing over every simplex or every single subsimplex in this chain of this differential form. So in a sense, we can break up this R chain into little pieces and then integrate just like first year calculus over every single piece of our differential form. Now, this is nice. And a nice theorem due to George Duram. Now, George Duram was a man. This was a manly guy. He did a lot with differential forms. Although he isn't the father or inventor of differential forms per se, there's a lot of debate. I read that, you know, differential forms are due to Elie Cartan, who is a French mathematician who developed them in the early 1900s. There's also, uh, I've read about Henri Poincaré, the other famous French mathematician who sort of was playing around with them in the 1800s, late 1800s. But you also read about George Duran. George Duram also worked with differential forms in the early stages. And he came up with this theory, this theorem, that states that there is a map, which we call capital lambda. And it's a map that takes in uh, an object, or it takes in a, an element from the Arth homology group and an object from the Arth cohomology group, and it gives you a number. Now, this map is bilinear and non-degenerate. Which is really saying that these cohomo this homology group and this cohomology group that I defined above, they're actually dual to each other, which is amazing. Uh, if you don't know the, the idea of a dual space, really, every vector space, finite dimensional vector space, comes with a dual space, which is almost like the, the sister space, if you will. And they're connected to each other in a very elegant way. They have the same dimension, even, uh, for finite dimensional vector spaces. And the nice thing here is that the K of cohomology group, now, I might have not mentioned it, and it might have been confusing, but these are actually finite dimensional spaces. Um, the dimension of your K of cohomology group is really, is, is K itself, right? Or, sorry, is N choose K, is the number of different K forms that you can have. Um, and the dimension of your K homology group is the dimension of the high simplex you have in your simplicial complex. And so these are all finite dimensional spaces. Um, and this map says that they are dual spaces of each other. And this map is, of course, given by this inner product that I was talking about. Now, I'm kind of being sneaky here, and I'm writing an element as kind of square brackets. Um, and this is, if you know about equivalence classes, this is, of course, me saying, given some equivalence class of, the, of an R chain and given an equivalence class of an R form, 
But if you don't know what equivalence classes means, go back to the definition here. I said it was like a set of sets. And this is really partitioning every, going back to specifically for case cohomology groups, it's taking your different K forms and putting them in, in a class. You're, you're making some sort of similarity operation in a sense saying that, okay, I'm going to call this K form similar to this K form if it satisfies a certain condition. And you take all these similar K forms that satisfy the condition, and we're just going to call them the same. Just shove them all in a class and denote it as kind of one element. So in this case, really, two K forms here, I'm going to call them the same if, if I, when I subtract the two, or sorry, two closed forms, my mistake, I'm going to call two closed forms the same or a part of the same class. If when I take the difference between the two, I get an exact form. And so what this class means for omega is that omega here will be in the same class as psi if I take omega subtracted by psi, I get an exact form. Similarly, for the Rth homology group, what this fancy notation is saying is that this is really the set of all R chains that are actually um, R cycles, where if I take the difference of any two R cycles, I get an R boundary. So these all these elements C, when I take the boundary of them, I get zero. Similarly here, all these omegas in this set are all closed forms. If I take the exterior derivative of them, I get zero. And we can write this mapping as such, given our inner product here. Now, of course, if you take in 277, this is the this is the holy grail of math right here. You know, most people will say, and I'm looking at you, Mahmood, most people will say that prime numbers are the holy grail of mathematics. Then, not quite true. Prime numbers are nice, but they're, they're confusing. They're, it's too, they're too intense. Like, don't worry about it. The holy grail of math is really Stokes' theorem and differential forms. And it's given by this form. And it's, it's so elegant, and it's very beautiful. Now, if you haven't taken 277 and you don't know what this is, this is okay. This is almost a primer, if you will, for when you take 277. And if you haven't taken 277, you should be excited. This is really the meat of an undergraduate career right here is Stokes theorem for an undergraduate math career. Now, let's kind of unpackage this. And it says right here that if we integrate some K form along the boundary of some R chain, this is the same as if we integrated the exterior derivative of this k-form along the original chain itself. Now, this is almost kind of shocking. It's, it's not really shocking. It's kind of expected if you kind of work through it using classical vector calculus and whatnot. There's various theorems that you might have heard of. Gauss's law, yeah, divergence theorem classical stokes theorem all those weird confusing things they're actually just special cases of stokes theorem this equation encapsulates all of it in one in a sense this is the fundamental theorem of calculus literally fundamental theorem of calculus not just one dimensional calculus every higher dimensional calculus you have this stokes theorem has it all everything encapsulated in one this is, this is really, this is the meat right here. This is really good stuff. Really, really good stuff. Now, we can sort of capsulate this. We can make it more compact. Using this inner product that I wrote up here, I can write Stokes theorem as such. I can write it as the boundary of C with omega is equal to C d omega. And this is, this is literally Stokes theorem right here. That's it, this line. And this encapsulates every integral theory that you know of, in a sense. But this says something deeper about the exterior derivative and the boundary operator. 
if you know about operator theory, if, and you know about adjoints of operators, well, this is really saying that the exterior derivative D is the adjoint of the boundary operator. That's pretty insane, man. That's pretty nuts. The fact that they're actually adjoints of each other. So that there's a very fundamentally deep and intimate relationship between differential forms and R chains, and it's given by Stokes' theorem. This is like, this is good stuff. This is really interesting. This is nice to think about. But this was kind of a nice little side effect of what's happening. But now I know there's some people in the audience that will get excited for this. Um, this is just like a fun for side thing if you know about these sort of things. But we can also have a sequence of mappings to kind of see the difference between the two. Where we know the boundary operator takes an R plus one chain, sends it to an R chain, and it sort of decreases the dimension of your chain as you go until you get to zero. And it's like the exterior derivative does exactly the opposite. It takes an R form and it brings it up by one to an R plus one form. And it keeps going until you get to zero, right? Of course, when you take D squared of, of, a, of a K form, you get zero. And so this is a nice kind of graphical way of saying, yeah, they, like you can really see how there's such a, there's a similarity between the two. And in fact, they're connected very intimately, which is very nice. But now I'm going to switch gears. Now we're going to just talk about physics. Now this is a physics talk. We're no longer talking about math. We're going to talk about physics. Great. Now, I know, I know Mahmood right now is, 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 is cowering in fear because we're talking about physics, but this is okay. We're not going to go super intense. But in physics, there are a set of equations called Maxwell's equations. And these are very fundamental these equations right here if you talk to any physicist and you ask them about maxwell's equations they will probably tell you essentially the spiel i just did about stokes theorem they will do the same about maxwell's equations every physicist worships these equations every physicist has a picture of these equations beside their bed and they look at them before they go to bed at night every night these equations are very very fundamental for physics specifically is a big cornerstone in classical mechanics was maxwell's equations they look confusing they look weird right like what is this upside down triangle what is this cross what is this dot and i mean of course if you've taken 276 and to actually just 276 and maybe even linear algebra 266 you'll know that oh well okay this is some sort of cross product this is a dot product and yeah that that's true it's it's in clunky notation. Don't really worry too much about the meanings of these equations. But the two that I want to talk about are these equations right here. Oops. This upside down triangle dotted with B equal to zero, and this upside down triangle dotted with E equal to rho. These are the two equations I want to look at for this last point. And specifically, the equation of interest is this, where it says upside down triangle dotted with B is zero. Now. Physicists also like to write their integrals as such. This is an example of a physics integral. And it looks terrifying. Uh, what does it mean to integrate some vector quantity? What is this dA vector? What, what does this mean? And I'm taking a dot product. I don't know what this means. What does this little circle mean right here? Like uh, Physicists like to complicate things a lot. Um, by making these weird notations and stuff like that. And, but what a physicist will tell you, if you show them this equation, what they'll say is that, well, this is saying that the magnetic flux of a magnetic field piercing a surface is zero. Okay. Now, this is nice, but what does this really mean? What, what, is, what is a magnetic flux? Uh, specifically, if we look at, Imagine this. This is, you might have recognized these pictures from physics, high school physics even, or if you've taken physics, first year physics, you'll know these. This is a picture of a proton, or, or a positive charge rather, and a negative charge. And this is what their electric fields will look like. You know, you, you can think of 
of a of a of a charge emanating a certain certain field, an electrical field, and positive charge fields point outwards, negative charge fields point inwards. And what this is saying is that if I took a positive charge and I think of dropping it right here, the line will tell me that's the direction that the charge will accelerate if I dropped a positive charge there. So that of course, we know that opposite charges attract and same charges repel. So I put up a positive charge here. It's going to want to move away from this positive charge. That's why the electric field lines are pointed away, because a positive charge will accelerate away if I dropped it there. Similarly, for a negative charge, if I dropped a negative or if I dropped a positive charge here, it'll attract, because right? Because they're opposite charges attract. And so that's what the field lines pointing inward means, is that that's the direction a positive charge will accelerate if I drop it there. And what the idea of a flux is, you might you might know what a flux is, um, but we can think of, in a second, ah, sorry about that, but you can imagine if we had a flux, or sorry, if we imagine having a bubble around this positive charge, so we kind of just encapsulate it in a weird bubble. And we're going to define the flux to be the amount of electric field that pierces through this bubble. So you can imagine if we encapsulate this charge in a bubble, the charge will emanate at field lines, and this these field lines will pierce the bubble in a sphere, actually, in a perfect sphere. It will pierce this bubble. And the amount of piercing the amount of the amount that the field lines pierce this bubble we can call a flux and that's in this case it'll be an electric flux and what this equation is saying right here this upside down triangle dotted with e is in a sense saying how much this flux is this is a measure of how much flux is piercing that surface and it's equal to rho and rho in physics is a charge density so really what this equation is saying is that if we have a plastic bubble around this positive charge, the amount of field lines that pierce this bubble is going to be equal to rho, which is the charge density, which is, in a sense, the total charge that the, that, the, that the particle has, which is nice. So in a sense, a flux is a measure of charge. It measures how much charge you have. Now... Imagine if we had this for magnet magnets. So you might know, this is a very famous photo. This is how a magnet works, right? You have a North Pole, you have a South Pole, and you have these lines, these magnetic field lines, where North always goes to South, right? And vice versa. And if you try, I mean, you've definitely have done this before if you were ever a child. You've definitely tried to put two North Poles together or two South Poles together, and it doesn't work, right? There's a repulsion between the two. Because similarly to electric charges, opposite poles attract, but, but uh, same poles repel. And this is a reason why the field lines, you have the field lines are going from North to South because it's almost like this North Pole wants to be attracted to the South Pole. So it's almost these field lines are showing you this attraction, in a sense. And funny enough, if you actually cut this magnet in half, say we wanted to get the North Pole by itself, we just cut it in half, will we be able to just get a North Pole by itself, and that's it? And similarly, can we just get a South Pole by itself, and that's it? And in this case, if we cut this North Pole in half and kind of separated it, it's almost like the field lines emanating from it will mimic exactly that of a positive charge, right? If a positive charge is by itself, the field lines go away. If we cut this North Pole in half and had it by itself, the field lines are going away. So it's, it's, it's almost natural to think, well, if I cut it in half, I will get the North Pole by itself and the South Pole by itself. Similarly, if with the South Pole by itself, the field lines are going into it. And in a sense, I can have a measure of charge. How much magnetic charge does this magnetic particle or this particle have? But the funny thing is, is that if you actually did cut this in half, it would make two magnets. If you cut this in half, 
immediately half of the North Pole will become the South Pole and half of the South Pole will become a North Pole. So you'll get two of these objects. So you can't actually separate them. You can't separate a North Pole from a South Pole. And this is funny, in a sense. It's highly non-trivial, and it's, 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 it's a very distinct, it's a subtle feature that very much distinguishes electric phenomena and magnetic phenomena. But it, it's weird because if you go back to Maxwell's equations, yeah, they look confusing and scary. But if you were to swap the roles of P or of B and E, B of, is of course the magnetic field, E is the electric field. Um, I should I should mention that at the beginning. I apologize if you were confused. B is the magnetic field, E is an electric field. But if I were to swap the two roles, if I made this an E and I made this a B. Well, that's just this equation. Similarly, if I made this a B and I made this an E, like there's a natural symmetry between the two. The, t the equations almost seem to work, even if I swap the roles of E and B. And that's a funny symmetry. It's a very subtle thing, but it's very nice. And these equations, by the way, of course, yes, they were derived from uh, basic principle, but they were more so discovered through experiment. If you know a little bit about the history, it was it was Michael Faraday who was a a, a British scientist uh, in, during the 1800s, early 1800s to late eight, to mid 1800s, and he actually started off as an orphan. He was very very poor. He worked as a book binder, and but he was obsessed with with science at the time. Of course, science in, in England was booming. You know, you have, you know, in physics, of course, in that time, it was almost, in a sense, this was the precursor to the late 1800s when people were discovering things like, like black body radiation and stuff like that. But at the time, it was very much into, uh, people were very much into thermodynamics, right? Steam engines, heat engines, uh, how, how heat can be converted to work. And so, Science at that time was very, very popular, and Faraday wanted to learn it all. But he was never really taught mathematics. In a sense, he, he, he never really understood advanced mathematics. So he got a job as an experimentalist working for another a famous scientist, David Humphrey. He worked as a lab assistant in David Humphrey's lab. And eventually, Michael Faraday worked his way up to become the head of the laboratory. and. He was only an experimentalist. And, but he was fascinated by electricity and magnetism. In particular, Faraday was the one who thought of the idea of a field, of an electric field, of a magnetic field. The idea that particles on their own emanate some sort of, some sort of force field, if you will, that tells other particles how to travel. And this was a big deal in physics. Of course, at the time, no one believed him. People just thought he was, you know, crazy and had no idea what he was talking about. But the explanation that Faraday had was almost very natural. It explained why Newton's equations for gravity could work. Because, you know, Newtonian gravity is the idea that two objects will attract each other. Right. But how do they attract each other? How do they know to move if there's nothing connecting them right there's not like a line physically a line in between two objects telling them to move or an elastic band even it's almost like they know how to move without ever communicating at all and people brought this up to isaac newton um uh contemporary physicists at the time and mathematicians even they said how how do planets know to orbit one another what is telling them to move how are they you know, communicating with each other. And Isaac Newton kind of was just like, hey, you know, God's doing it. Don't worry about it. God's making sure that they're moving. And of course, at the time, that was a plausible explanation, right? Um, and so people just kind of accepted it as that. But it was Michael Faraday that really said, well, okay, well, God may be doing it, fine, whatever. But really, it's these, it's an electric field and the magnet, it's these fields that are telling a particle or a planet how to move once a particle feels this field 
that's the communication between the two telling them how to move. So he came up with an explanation of a gravitational field where a planet sitting in space emanates a gravitational field. And it's when another planet feels this gravitational field, that's when it knows how to move. Similarly, this electric field around this positive charge is emanating from it, and it's telling other positive charges how to move when it, it touches this electric field. And so Maxwell now was a young boy at the time when Faraday would make his claims, but when Maxwell became older, he was... I, I, I kind of consider Maxwell to be the first modern mathematical physicist. I mean, there's debates about it, sure, why not? But I, I, I like Maxwell because he took ideas from physics. In a sense, he took experimental facts and converted it into a mathematical theory. He literally took uh, Faraday's results, his experimental results about electric fields and magnetic fields, and he derived mathematical equations for it. And that's why I kind of deem it to be the first uh, mathematical physicist because he sort of, in a way, thought about if we take experimental physics, if we take ideas from physics, convert it into mathematics, and kind of study the mathematics on its own, which is nice. And so that's kind of the background of these equations. But it's in classical, it's in a weird clunky notation. And in a sense, you can convert this into differential forms. Funny enough, when you convert all these into differential forms, all these four equations become two equations, and they become simple equations, very simple, less complicated than this. Now, going back to why magnetic monopoles can exist is let's imagine for now that if we cut this magnetic bar in half and we just said sure let's say that the north pole became a north pole on its own and it started emanating magnetic field lines outward much like this positive charge so that in a sense we can have a concept of of, uh, of a charge for a magnetic for a particle emanating a magnetic field and if we computed the flux, if we computed this integral, then we should get a non-zero answer, right? If you have a North Pole by itself emanating magnetic field lines, if you imagine putting this North Pole in a bubble, then the amount of, uh, of magnetic field piercing this bubble should be non-zero. And this is really what this equation is saying. The reason why this is zero is because if you imagine putting the North Pole and a South Pole in a bubble and compute the amount of magnetic field piercing this bubble, well, you can see that the amount going out of the bubble equals the same amount going into the bubble. So if we say going out of the bubble is positive and going in the bubble is negative, then the amount going out of the bubble is the same as the amount going in, but in a negative sign, they cancel each other out. That's why this equation is saying the magnetic flux is zero, piercing this bubble. Um, that's what this equation is saying, and really this is the exact same equation, but just in a different form. So that if we had magnetic monopoles, we should be able to isolate a North Pole, put it in a bubble, compute the amount of magnetic flux piece in this bubble and get a positive answer. And this would be our magnetic charge. And in fact, we can check this. Uh, now, this equation actually in coordinates, this weird upside down triangle is a fancy way of saying a vector, but the entries are derivative operators. So that you can imagine it, if I took the dot product with the entries of your magnetic field. Again, magnetic field B is a is really a function from R3 to R3. Same with E. E is really just a function from R3 to R3. So if I took the dot product with this vector, then I would get this equation right here. Which is saying, all right, differentiate the first component with respect to x1, differentiate the second component with respect to x2. 
and so on. Now, we can rewrite these equations in differential forms. This is the beauty of it, and it simplifies things so much more when you convert these into differential forms. We can define a two-form, which is really just the magnetic field, but expressed as a differential form. Where we write B1 as the first component, dx2 wedge dx3, B2, d3 wedge, uh, dx3 wedge dx1, plus B3, dx1 wedge dx2. And this is just the magnetic field in terms of differential forms. It, it, it's a two-form, in fact. Naturally, it is a two-form. And the reason why these these no, this notation is clunky, and I'm not a fan of it, because it's just equivalent to the exterior derivative. If you go up here, this curl, this divergence, all these different op different operations that physicists use, it's it's all just the exterior derivative. In fact, E, the electric field, is nothing but a one form. And if you take the exterior derivative of a one form, that is equivalent to the curl. Similarly, if you take the exterior derivative of a two form, that is equivalent to this divergence, this, this dot product here. And the difference here is that the curl of B, well, I just said that the exterior derivative of a one form is, um, is the curl, but B is a two form. So shouldn't this be the dot product because the exterior derivative of a two form is the dot product or is the divergence well this is kind of special um, there's something subtle happening there's a different operator behind the scenes called the hodge star which in a sense converts uh two forms into one forms and it converts one forms into two forms that is if we're dealing in r3 but that's for a different different discussion but the main point here is that we can write this magnetic field as a two form. And if we compute the exterior derivative, you can, you can check this. If you compute the exterior derivative, you get exactly this equation up here. And this is showing you that really the exterior derivative of a two form is identical to this, to this divergence thing up here. So this is what is really happening. Now, the condition here for Maxwell's equation is that the divergence of B is zero is equivalent to saying that the exterior derivative is zero. Well, what does that mean? That means that B is, an, is a closed form. It's a closed two form. So if you take the exterior derivative of it, you get zero. The reason why you get zero, well, that's from experiment, right? It's not something that you can derive just from having a dream and realizing, ah, yes, it has to be zero. Rather, it's from experiment. Uh, this is what nature seems to act like, act like. So we're going to go with it and say that, yeah, the exterior derivative of this magnetic two form has to vanish. So that now the question is, is B exact? This is important because if B is exact, that means there exists a one form such that when I take the exterior derivative of this one form, I get B. Now, the, it's, important to, it, it's, it's important to ask if it's exact, because we can compute the magnetic flux, which really, this complicated integral, if you convert this into differential forms, is really just this integral right here, which looks, it's, it's, it's nicer. If we imagine this open set being our bubble around our magnetic charge, then we would want the amount of magnetic field piercing this bubble to be non-zero. We want it to actually be a positive number because then this number would represent a magnetic charge. And I represent this charge to be phi. And the, to compute the amount of magnetic field lines piercing this bubble, I'm going to integrate our magnetic field along the boundary of the bubble. So I really just care about the boundary of the bubble, how much line is piercing the boundary of the bubble. But we know that from Stokes' theorem, right, if B is exact, then Stokes' theorem tells me that this integral can be written as the integral 
along the bubble of the of db but if d if b is exact then this is equal to d of da but d squared is zero so this tells me that okay well if b is exact then from stokes theorem the magnetic flux has to be zero so Stokes theorem is telling me that if this magnetic field is an exact two form, then no magnetic monopoles can exist because then there would be no, there would be no net flux piercing my bubble, which means that the amount of magnetic field lines going out of my bubble somehow has to be canceled by the amount going into my bubble, which is really saying that a North pole has to be with the South pole always. Locally, anyways, this is important. If B is exact, no magnetic monopoles can exist locally. Now, what do I mean by locally? Well, I mean exactly by putting it in a bubble. If I'm putting it in a bubble, then locally, as in inside this bubble, inside this open set, magnetic monopoles can exist. So inside this open set, the amount of magnetic field lines piercing this bubble has to be the amount going into this bubble. Now, the idea is that, well, is B exact? And I didn't really answer this question. Is it exact? If it is, magnetic monopoles can exist. If it isn't, then I can't do this. And we might have a dream that there would be some net positive charge. But, alas, there is a theorem which crushes the dream of magnetic monopoles existing locally. Locally. Keyword, locally. And this is the theorem. On every open set, so in every bubble I have, we have that these two groups are identical. So the amount of closed R-forms equals the... or Every closed R-form is, clo is, is an exact R-form. So every exact form is closed locally. And so that says that locally in this bubble, B in fact is exact. Locally in this bubble, there does exist the one form such that DA is equal to B. In fact, in physics, A is called the vector potential. And the existence of this vector potential tells you that magnetic monopoles cannot exist locally. Remember, locally. So, alas, we will never witness with our own eyes magnetic monopoles, which is kind of sad. You know, I, I think about it and I get sad sometimes. But the idea, the important takeaway message is that this is only locally. That is, if I have coordinates, if I go in a laboratory and set up my laboratory coordinates, and if I put, if I cut the North Pole from its South Pole and I put it in a bubble, and I measure the amount of magnetic flux going out of that bubble, it'll always be zero. Locally, inside my laboratory, there will never be magnetic monopoles. But globally, however globally, there are magnetic monopoles. And this is an interesting thing. How it's, it's, it's weird how electric phenomena and magnetic phenomena are so connected, so intertwined, Locally, you can have electric charge on its own. That's fine. But locally, you cannot have magnetic charge on its own. But globally, you can. So there is, there is a difference between the two. And the equations that describe this global phenomena are, Steve might get mad at me, but they're called Bogomolny equations, which are a certain dimensional reduction of Yang-Mills equations. And the solutions of these equations describe magnetic monopoles uh, globally existing in your space. And you can form a moduli space of all of these magnetic monopoles, of, of these solutions. And this becomes the moduli space of magnetic monopoles, or, or, or moduli space of monopoles. And it's a very interesting object to study. And it's very, for anyone who knows a bit about Higgs bundles, if you've heard about Higgs bundles before, um, the moduli space of magnetic monopoles is very, very closely related to the moduli space of Higgs bundles. Of course, they're different objects, 
but they stem from the same equations. They stem from the same Yang Mills equations, at least in terms of gauge theory. And really fascinating, really, really cool. So to end the talk, unfortunately, locally, magnetic monopoles don't exist because Stokes theorem deems so. And if Stokes theorem deems so, then I suppose it is appropriate. If it was prime numbers that deem so, then, I mean, I don't believe it. I, I'm going to disprove it. But if Stokes' theorem tells you it, then what can you do, right? But yeah, that was my talk. Sorry to end on a sad note. They still exist globally, but that was my talk. Uh, thank you for listening, if you did. Now you can yeah, hear my uh, all solitary done. applause. Hopefully this is echoing uh, throughout your households right now. Uh, thank you, Robert. Um, and yes. Thank you, everyone who has been uh watching robert warned me beforehand that this is going to be a little longer of a talk and unfortunately i did not warn everyone in the audience but thank you for sticking around uh we will uh if anyone has any extra questions uh you can put them in the chat or you can join our discord and then you can join the question queue and then we'll drag you right into this conversation you can speak to robert directly uh we'll just uh, hang around for a second for that robert do you have any any other thoughts i know you have a lot of thoughts so I do actually have I do have another thing. If anyone is interested, I know Mahmood right now is is like jumping from excitement right now. He wants to learn about magnetic monopoles so bad. You can, and I have some books for you. This is a book that I recommended for my last talk. Is you have this book right here, Geometry, Topology, and Physics. This book is like. If you're interested in mathematical physics, this is like the Bible of mathematical physics. This is a good book. I love this book. Even if you don't even like physics, I would still recommend getting this book. Is it the New Testament or the uh, Old Testament? Second, uh, this, this is, is the this is the new. I would say this is the New Testament. This is good stuff. Okay. Second book. This is has nothing to do with magnetic monopoles, but has a lot to do with differential forms. Is I would recommend this book. Introduction to Smooth Manifolds. This is a good book to learn differential forms, tensors, uh, you know, manifolds, etc. This is a great book. Um, I'm putting your camera and, uh, up. Can you flash those books again so you can get a better look at the authors? Oh, yeah, yeah. The author of this book is, is John M. Lee. He's, he's a really good author. I really like this book a lot, actually. Um, this book is, is Michio Nakahara. Nakahara, again, a phenomenal author. I like him a lot. This is a great book. Um, I do have another book. This book's a fancy book. It's a, it's a Princeton University Press book. But if you really want to learn more about magnetic monopoles, this book. It's The Geometry and Dynamics of Magnetic Monopoles, written by Nigel Hitchin and Michael Atia, two famous, famous mathematicians. This is a good book. This is a good book to have. But yes, those are my recommendations for you. Okay, awesome. Uh, I think we've gotten a couple of compliments in the chat. Um, I'm going to clap again. I don't think anyone can come up with any specific questions. So. And I'll just switch over to the grid view. Um, in other news uh, related to MSQ, we're going to have another talk next week. Uh, Mahmood is going to be doing the exercises that Robert uh, told him to do next week. No, I'm, I'm kidding. He's going to be good. doing his, his own thing, if, I'm, if I can recall correctly. So I'm very excited for that. We're going to have two weeks of talks in a row. And uh, we'll be seeing you next week. We'll get an abstract uh, through the email list. You can sign up for that if you're not uh, in the description. So uh, have a good one and uh, goodbye. Robert, you want to say goodbye?